Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me, tuning in today. Let me share with you, uh, today I want to do something really different. Uh, this is a magic forum. I do magic presentation. I want to try to make the case that what I'm going to share with you, which is not magic, will have a bearing on your performance career if, if you take the time to invest in it. It will positively impact not only the way that you perform, not only the way that you interact with your customers and clients, but also with your life in general. This will make your life better, I promise you. It's called The Benevolence of Manners. It was written by Linda uh, Leichter. I think that's how you pronounce her name. It's L-I-C-H-T-E-R. Uh, I read this book in 2004, and it's one of those books that changed my life. It truly, honestly did. It changed my life. I'm going to share with you some quotes from the book. I'm going to try to explain why it changed my life. I'm going to try to uh, help you understand how you can apply it to your own life. But I wanted to share it with you. Again, I, I hope you watch this to the end because I think it's very important. Linda Leiter uh, was born in 1955. She passed away in 2009, so she's no longer with us. She was still alive when I first read the book in 2004. She was a social scientist and author who became influential in what's called the Neo-Victorian movement. The Neo-Victorian movement. Now, let me share with you something. I'm a subculture person. I've been a subculture person for many years. I was a goth, still am a goth as far as I'm concerned. I believe that goth is something you are, something you always are. You don't have to dress like one. You don't have to behave like one. It's an aesthetic. It's a value. It's part of who you are. It's part of your personality. Uh, steampunk, I really enjoy. I was at the first Steampunk World's Fair up in New Jersey. They thought they were going to get, I think, now the numbers might be wrong. I might be incorrect, but they thought they were going to get maybe 3,000 people coming out for that. They had something like 10,000. They, they were sold out of rooms. People were sleeping on the floor. They ran out of food. It was unbelievable, but it was the first Steampunk World's Fair, and I was there, folks. I was there. Uh, but I want, to, I want to make a distinction between Steampunk and the Neo-Victorian movement. Steampunk projects modern technology, or at least some parts of it, back into the Victorian age. And they kind of reconstruct the Victorian age based on that anachronism. Uh, and that's great. I mean, I, I love that too. Uh, there are people that consider themselves time travelers because they're sort of out of time. And, uh, and, and those are steampunks. The Neo-Victorians the Neo-Victorians championed what was, what was good, and not everything was good, but they championed what was good in the Victorian age and tried to recapture it in today's time. And I consider myself a Neo-Victorian as opposed to a steampunk. Uh, you will see Victorianism in my values, in my selection of material as a magician. It, it is part of who I am. It's a high value for me, and this book was incredibly important at helping me understand how to take the very best from chivalry and manners and decency in the Victorian age and bring it into our modern time. She was, Linda was, the co-director of the Center for Media and Public Affairs in Washington, D.C., she has written for the Wall Street Journal, Reader's Digest, and the New York Times. The Benevolence of Manners was first published in 1999. She also wrote a book called Simple Social Graces, Recapturing the Lost Art of Gracious Victorian Living in 1998. So it preceded this one. Now, let me talk for just a moment about the Victorian period and why I think it is so important. First of all, I, I think what we need right now in the United States of America, if not worldwide, but you know, I, I live in the United States, so I can't comment on the Soviet Union, I can't comment on China, I can't comment on Australia, I can't comment on the UK. I can really only comment on what I see in my half, on my, my side of the, of the world. 
And what I see right now is a woeful lack of manners and civility. I see it everywhere. I see it in the workplace. I see it in customers. I, I see it in co-workers. I see it on television. I see it in the mainstream media. A woeful lack of manners and civility. If we could recapture the decency and honesty of, of the benevolence of manners of, of, of Victorian etiquette, and Victorian decorum and bring some of that into our modern time, I think we'd be so much better off. So much better off. And I'm going to share with you some, some practical ways in which we can do this. For me, though, what, what was so exciting, other than the manners and civility, now I know what you're probably thinking. You're thinking, you know, uh, you're talking about manners and civility in the age that produced Jack the Ripper. And that is true. That is true. There are some very interesting things that happened in the Victorian age. But I want to give you a, a sense for another Victorian strength. And I think, I think this was a strength because of manners and civility. We live in an age when it's dangerous to be a free thinker. If you express your ideas too vocally, too publicly, and those ideas are not part of the mainstream, you can get in some heap of trouble, let me tell you. Not because you said anything illegal, not because you said anything profane or immoral, but because you said something that offended somebody. They're offended, and so you're going to pay a price. And that's not manners, and that's not civility. But that's the age in which we live. So for me, what was best in the Victorian period was ideological freedom. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, David, David, ideological freedom in the Victorian age. You bet. Now, now go back just a little further, okay? You're in the age of the Renaissance. You're in the age of enlightenment. Uh, the stranglehold of church ideology is beginning to loosen up. People are starting to think freely. Uh, and, and you get some things emerging. Let me share with you some of the things that emerged in the Victorian age. Spiritualism was born in 1848. It grew and thrived throughout the Victorian age. Spiritism as well. Spiritism was on the other side of the pond. Spiritualism really was born in the United States. It, it, it traveled across to Europe. But uh, kind of its own root in Europe was, was spiritism, the same kind of ideas. You also had theosophy. Theosophy's official birth date was November 17th, 1875. Then you had Thelema, which was Aleister Crowley's uh, ideology. You had the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, born in 1887. Then you had New Thought. Now, New Thought, if you didn't know, New Thought, there's a guy named Waddles who really published the first motivational book. And that book became an inspiration to people like Norman Vincent Peale, who became an inspiration to Zig Ziglar. So a lot of these people call themselves Christians, and they are, they are. They're, they're, there's nothing contrary about New Thought. Um, but New Thought is an ideology that was born and nurtured in the Victorian age and has grown and flourished in our own time. Much of who we are, much of what we have, was born in the Victorian period. The Industrial Revolution came out of the, of the, of the Victorian age. People, we became less rural. We became more city-dwelling. We became more urban. And so we became more aware of each other. We interacted with each other more. We interacted with ideas more. We had more leisure time. So we could invest in ideas. The Ouija board came out that toward the end of the 19th century, spirit boards were born. And they were manufactured right here in Baltimore, Maryland. Charles Darwin was a child of the, of the Victorian age. Sigmund Freud was a child of the Victorian age. The railway was born and grew in the Victorian age. The telegraph was born and grew in the Victorian age. The tarot well precedes the Victorian period, but it was, it was Pamela Coleman Smith and the, and the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn 
that took images for each card and laid them on each card and you got what what has become the modern tarot in the Victorian age. Now none of that none of that could have happened in an atmosphere of stranglehold ideology that basically says if you don't have this ideology you're either going to hell or you're an ignorant buffoon. You just don't get it. You, you had all that development because people felt free to develop ideological tolerance, manners, and civility are the most important gift from the Victorian age, and that is what is dealt with in this book. So let me give you a few things to think about in this book. On page 8, under the heading Self-Restraint and Sacrifice. She says, what were the nuts and bolts of the remarkable code that sustained the lawfulness and civility we associate with the Victorian era? It had a broad and inclusive religious foundation. Important word there, inclusive. Religious foundation that was a far cry from the Bible-thumping moralism of today. It stressed hard work frugality, sobriety, honesty, civic responsibility, sexual decency, good deeds, self-restraint, and self-sacrifice. To our generation, equating love with sacrifice and self-restraint is difficult to understand, much less accept. Isn't love a vehicle of individual happiness? Now she's asking that facetiously. If you randomly stopped people on the street and asked them to assess their lives, most would ask themselves, am I happy? But a Victorian would ask, am I a good person? In the Victorian value system, it was more important to be a good surf person and a good servant and a, and a good member of the community than it was important to be happy. Happiness was derived from being a good person and a contributing member of your community. In the seamless web of Victorian connections, self-fulfillment required social virtue. Conversely, the fate of the community depended on a view of happiness that transcended a personal wish list of experiences and acquisitions. In the pursuit of happiness, the first right step is to seek that which is good to do, not merely for oneself, but for others. Ultimately, we reach the public good. Now I'm going to flip through here in, in order of the book and give you some things to think about. I'm hoping that you'll go ahead and buy the book and read it. I think it will make the same change for you that it made for me. I think it will have a high impact on you. Let me share page 58. Uh, Linda is defining what the Victorian saw as a gentleman. You've probably heard that word tossed about. I know that uh, if you watch, for example, the Titanic film, uh, you'll, you'll hear uh, a distinction between a gentleman and a lower class person. So you will get that. But really, uh, gentlemanliness is defined by character. And so let me, let me share this with you. The gentleman, as Hale wrote, in her 1868 book, Manners, was first and foremost a gentle man. She portrayed a gentleman's balanced character. He was respectful, but not groveling to his superiors, tender and considerate to inferiors, and helpful and protecting to the weak. Sounds like a Marine, doesn't it? In many respects, uh, I, I think the Marines kind of got some of their code from, from the Victorians. According to author Martine's Handbook of Etiquette, 1866, a gentleman possessed a high sense of honor, a determination never to take a mean advantage over others, an adherence to truth, delicacy, and politeness toward all. As Miss Humphreys' 1897 Manners for Men put it, the Victorian male was dependable in trifles as well as the large affairs of life. So, and, and on and on it goes to finding what, what gentlemanliness 
is truly all about. So let me share this with you from page 72. Nature teaches two savages to approach each other as enemies, each suspicious of the hostile intent of the other, maintains a natural right to kill that other in self-defense. Civilization, just drawing a contrast now between civilized people and savages. Civilization teaches each man to respect the right of the other to live and to refrain from killing him in the hope and expectation that the other will be equally considerate. By this definition, we certainly have gotten back to nature. The Victorians would say we've regressed rather than evolved. In contrast to today's vague calls for civility, which leads us stranded in the wilderness without a road map, the Victorians' well-marked connections between social theory and personal practice gave strength and sparkle to both. Now she's quoting here from Eliza, Eliza Duffy's 1877 book on manners and etiquette. Civilization has its laws, civil, religious, and social, binding upon the community. Etiquette may be considered as the bylaws of civilization. I really like that, the bylaws of civilization. Now here on page 121 is a story I want to share with you. And this story really, really elevated the whole idea of Victorian etiquette and manners for me. And by the way, you're, you're probably wondering, if you've watched this far, you're probably wondering what does this have to do with magic? I'm making the case that if you embrace good manners and civility and etiquette, you will be more likable as a performer. More and varied kinds of people will be able to embrace you and more importantly you will be able to embrace them because you've learned to be well-mannered, you've learned to be civil, you've learned etiquette so that you're not offending someone. That's what it can do for you. It won't make you a better magician as a performer but it will make you more likable and more accessible to your audiences. That's why this is important for magic. That's why I'm hoping that you're watching. Now, listen to this story. Our brutal honesty has become sheer brutality. The Victorians aspired to be, in the words of the 17th century essayist Thomas Fuller, cordial to the soul, cordial to the soul. We have lost our culture's soul and even our ability to understand how simple cordiality sustains human dignity. This is illustrated in the classic Victorian novel The Rise of Silas Lapham by William Dean Howells. In his 1885 comedy of manners, the bumbling social climate by the name of Silas He's invited to dine with the ultra-respectable Corey family. He frantically consults etiquette books to determine what color gloves and caveat he should wear. He becomes farcically obsessed with the details, behavior the Victorians themselves derided as the silver fork school of etiquette. For all his satoral pains, he gets roaring drunk at the dinner party. He insults his host and mortifies his own family. The next day, Silas bemoans his disgrace to the Corey family's son and asks what the senior Corey said about his boorish behavior after he left the party. The young man answers matter-of-factly, it's a quote, my father doesn't talk his guests over one another. You were among gentlemen. If Silas had learned the spirit, not just the letter of the etiquette books he read, he would have known that whatever passes in parties at your own or another house is never repeated by well-bred people. But it was also soothing and forgiving. In other words, what you're reading here, there, there's, a, there's a biblical passage that says, 
love covers a multitude of sins. And I believe that we are called upon by civil people, as civil people, not necessarily to cover or dismiss, but to guard each person's dignity and pride. You don't want to ever embarrass someone. And, and if this man had left the party, and they all would have talked about what a buffoon he was, they would have been lesser, not him. You understand? They would have been lesser. That's not what you do. That's not what civilized people do. I want to share this, this one last thing with you from the book. It's on page 305. She's addressing the subject of character. She says, and I'm quoting, This century turned character into a synonym for odd, eccentric, or peculiar, and a reference to actors who didn't play romantic leads. The meat of Victorian character and morality, hard work, frugality, sobriety, non-brutal honesty, sexual decency, civic participation, self-sacrifice and self-restraint got charred beyond recognition when the jazz, jazz age turned happiness on its head, making it self-centered instead of centered on others. We've been tinkering with the recipe for happiness ever since. We think happiness is out there. Happiness is a byproduct of service to others. That is the Victorian value. If the benevolence of manners sparks an interest in manners and, and etiquette in you as it did in me, you may want to invest in this book, Etiquette for Dummies by Sue Fox. I got to know Sue Fox not very well, but I corresponded with her. She has a, not a franchise, but she, she licenses some of this material to teach. I actually purchased that license. I was going to do Etiquette for the Workplace. She has a, a companion book to this about etiquette in the workplace. Uh, I never actually got around to doing that, but, but it's uh, an ambition that I had. I want to share with you a few things from Sue's book, just to kind of wet your whistle a little bit if you want to go beyond the benevolence of manners into something a little more contemporary. Here she says on page in the introduction, etiquette, a fancy word for getting along with others. And that's really the key. The reason you want to study manners, the reason you want to study civility, the reason you want to study etiquette is so that you can better get along with others. Your success as a performer will be based in part on your originality and your proficiency as a performer, but to a greater extent it will be based on your ability to get along with others. That's why this is so important for you to understand. Page 2. Etiquette is your key to surviving every human contact with your sense of humor and self-esteem intact and your reputation enhanced. Poise is the process of evaluating a situation and responding in a way that moves things toward the desired outcome. Poise is often associated with leadership. Politeness is taking the lead, making guests feel welcome, taking time to evaluate their needs and intentions of others, behaving in a way that ensures a pleasant outcome. Politeness works everywhere, all the time. There's no such thing as a vacation from manners. Now, if you think manners is just about where to put your fork or how to hold your teacup, not at all, not at all. Manners and etiquette is about how you behave in different situations. What is the most appropriate response in different situations? Folks, this is different. I, I, I have to admit this is different. It's not a magic book. It's not mainstream magic. But I believe it will make you a better performer. I believe it will make you more successful. And I believe it will make you happier. Folks, thank you so much for joining me. Please comment down below. I love your comments. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. I will see you next time.